What's up, everybody? This is Mike O'Geeky, host of the Mike O'Geeky podcast. Uh, we try to go deep so you can level up your mycology game at home. Uh, tonight, I am very excited. We have a special guest, uh, a continuation of uh, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about breeding mushrooms. Uh, we have another mushroom breeder who's doing some different stuff, and we're going to get into it and talk to him about it. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to welcome to the podcast, Wumbo Maiko. What's up, man? How's it going? Good. It's going well. Uh, very excited to have you on. Uh, it was a lot of fun talking to uh, Julian and Kylor a couple weeks ago and getting into some of the stuff that they're doing. And I like talking to you, too, because you're also doing some cool stuff. Um, so uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, how about we start out and tell people a little bit, because uh, one of the things that I, I'm discovering as I'm doing this is I can talk to a certain set of people and they're like, yeah, Wumbo Maiko, sure, I've bought his avalanche, all his genetics are fire, the most vigorous stuff I've ever grown comes from this guy. And then other people go, who? Who's that guy? <laughs> oh, because they're, they're just on a different platform, you know? Not yeah. everybody cross-pollinates to different platforms, so they don't always know <clears throat> everybody. So why don't you just give us a, a lowdown, how long you've been growing, what got you into it? Um, mm -hmm. and kind of how you've evolved over the years. Cause you've been growing, I believe seven years. Is that correct? Yeah. So around yeah, okay. seven years, I first started very, very casual. I was very interested in mushrooms. Um, what sort of spurred the initial interest was, um, sort of, a, a mild dose, um, trip that I took and I went on a very long hike with some friends. And when we came back, um, I sort of started asking my friends all sorts of questions about how uh, I had heard they'd grown mushrooms before and, um, you know, they had done PF tech under their bed kind of thing. It was just so sim simple sounding that I was really, I was like, I just want to get into this because it that's, sounds so and, amazing. And that's where you're supposed to put your PF tech, I believe. Right, is, exactly. It's under, under your bed. bed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it was a very simple, you know, inspiration for me that made me sort of dive deep into the gourmets initially. Um, I started growing reishi, lion's mane, pink oyster mushrooms, and, um, and then eventually started moving on to um, more species of medicinals like cubes. Um, over the first three years of, of growing, though, since you know, when, when I started, there was not so much a social media presence as there is now um, for the mushroom community. When I first started um, cultivating and just doing genetics work and stuff like that, it was uh, incredibly hard to find facts, you know, and, and like good information um, that I could, I could find citations for, or I could find reasonable evidence to believe things like that. Um, Wait a minute. So hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> but if you were on the shroomery, <laughs> I mean, that's the authority though, right? I mean, yeah. that's where the information comes from. And like the hand of God, you better believe them or you will be. <laughs> Many people would say so. And yeah. I would honestly say there is good stuff oh, yeah. to be found in the shroomery. Um, yeah. But there is a lot of myth and mythos um, to be right. found as well, because um, especially, you know, especially seven years ago when I first started growing, there was a lot of, um, just myth around what works, what doesn't work, what you can and can't do, all of these things. Um, I think a lot of the community had it in their mind that breeding was not even a thing people should think about, like not even really possible for a oh. long time until maybe like three years ago, four years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, but you wanted to do it. Am I, am I right in saying that? You, so the interest, the, yeah, the interest was yeah. there before the information was there. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, when I when I first started hearing rumors about, you know, snake venom and I started hearing right. rumors about other ways that you could cross, um, it got me super, super interested. And I mean, my my sort of my reaction to that was to just fiendishly search through all of the um uh, you know, all the forums, all of the research papers, all of the citations and sources that I could and anecdotal experiences that I could to see what people said about breeding. Um, right. Eventually, um, I was actually at the time working at a company that was teaching me cereal dilutions for 
um, testing mi microbiological contamination of nutraceuticals. So okay. we were testing for human pathogens, things like that. Right. And from learning cereal dilution there and then learning about um, sort of the traditional method of breeding with one spore, single spore isolations, um, pairing them together, that sort of spurred me on to say like, okay, now I'm going to start doing cereal dilutions of spores to try and isolate single spores to try and make this a possibility. And uh, it was actually interesting because within a good six months or year of me really getting inspired and doing that, I saw a lot of people following the same path. And uh, yeah. I do think it's convergent thinking, you know, I don't think necessarily anybody's copying anybody else uh, so much, but um, I think that it's uh, an, a very interesting subject with not a lot of information around it that uh, caught the attention of a lot of people breeding in particular. So now we're, so you're working for a company, you're doing cereal dilutions, you know, I don't know, looking for E. coli or whatever. Yeah. Um, Staphylococcus, E. coli. And, yeah. And, and you didn't have, I'm trying to, I'm trying to recall here. Cause I, I don't know if I even remember a time before Amazon, but you couldn't just go on Amazon and buy all this stuff. Right. So you had to, no, this was a yeah. little bit further back. So, you, so luckily you work for a place, they probably helped you figure out how to obtain the stuff and, and yeah, that was a little right. bit in when I first started um, looking into breeding, that was probably three or four years ago. So I had, mm -hmm. I had stumbled through for a good three years. Um, and, and before I actually started getting very serious about like that kind of lab work. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> but, um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, what was the question again? Oh, uh, I just, I interrupted you talking about uh, trying to, frame everything under the guise of there there's no amazon you were working oh, yeah, for yeah, a yeah, company yeah, yeah, yeah. fortunately you, yeah. you you were taught sourcing this method was, yeah sourcing was very hard when um when i first started uh all the way up until about three or four years ago um mm -hmm. with breeding in particular the sourcing was not that hard because a lot of the things you need for cereal dilutions and stuff are just very basic um materials that you would use for any other scientific experiments uh, micro centrifuge tubes and um you know, 15 milliliter tubes and um, pipettes and stuff like that, you know. Um, um, but yeah, when I first started, definitely, um, I was using a lot. I was using, uh, what do you call it, shroom supply quite a lot. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I've had good experiences with them. I've had bad experiences with them. And definitely, you know, like buying, when I first started buying sterilized grains from them, stuff like that, I would have a lot of issues. They're probably sending it quite a far distance to me. The grains probably weren't as new as they should have been when, you know, stuff like right. that. So um, I started having some negative experiences and then realizing like, I need to do all this stuff myself and yeah. control it. You know, um, this is, and, that, that is, that's like a, a rite of passage. <laughs> I, I think in, in at home mycology, there's a point where you mm -hmm. go, why? Yeah, I should probably just do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it, the, I think a rite of passage is, is losing, um, an inordinate amount of grain <laughs> jars or bags at one right. point, uh, yes. either out of cockiness or from laziness, you know, <laughs> lazy is um, my, that's my excuse. Yeah. Laziness is my excuse, but sometimes I do a go, get a little too, uh, too assured of how much I know, you know, mm. and, uh, and I'll run, run some bags and not really check my measurements too much, stuff like right. that. Yeah. Right. Anyway. Um, yeah, so sourcing is a lot easier now. There are mm -hmm. many great people who um, who have all sorts of different tools that they're developing, jar lids, sterilizing tools, oh, yeah. all sorts of stuff that people are putting out there um, that make what I went through, which is taking three years in order to actually get to the point where I'm like interested in actually experimenting with agar on a major level. Um, and, and working with isolations and stuff. Uh, you mean that, so there was a time before tip of the cat mushrooms. <laughs> yes. 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 You had to figure it tip. out yourself. Yes. Tip is a fantastic, uh, oh, yeah. resource for a lot of people. And I mean, even I actually buy plates from him, um, because my flow hood oftentimes is just full of stuff, full, full yep. of work and I don't have time to pour plates myself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, he's a great resource for people. Um, and yeah, no, um, it, it, what I was, yeah, the, the point that I wanted to make was just that, um, now you being able to utilize a lot of these people helps you expedite oh, yeah. that three year process that I had into six months or a year, you know, right. 
most of the people I see getting into mushrooms now are able to get to a point where they're, you know, maybe not as experienced as I am as far as like growing all these different and sort of having a good feel for it. But like getting to the point where they can talk to me on a level where they're telling right. me stuff I don't know sometimes, you know, right. like um, within a year. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think the resources out there are uh, awesome and enable people to sort of dive into their niche and learn more about it um, so that people like me who sort of like get enthusiastic about everything don't have to right. be specialized in everything. We can be generalists and yep. you know, have our interests. I'm with you. And, and so it, it's sort of a natural progression. You trudged for years through the muck and the mire trying to figure things out. And then mm -hmm. people like me come in <laughs> and in 10 months, people are like, I've had people be like, so master grower, how long yeah. have you been growing? And I'm like, bro, I am not a master grower. I am an enth enthusiastic grower for yeah. sure. Um, and I pay attention and I listen. I, if someone I, tells me to do something, I do it. But, but, but I'm, you know, just now feeling like I have a handle of uh, uh, some basics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't feel any type of way about it. I mean, like one of my best friends is Miss Mush SoCal and um mmsc labs on instagram mm -hmm. she she's an amazing um oh, yeah. uh, uh, geneticist and she does work that's on par and sometimes even better than mine um mm -hmm. her iceberg is amazing and i run it oh, all the yeah. time but um my point is she got into this a year and a half ago something yeah. like that you know um maybe two years I, I i'm not entirely sure but it's it's you know she's fairly new to it right and she's putting out amazing work that I respect heavily. You know, right. um, I just, all I look for in other people is the passion. And as long as they care about what they're doing, they want to learn more. Like I respect the hell out of anything any, anyone's doing. Um, and as far as like, um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, it's, it's fantastic for newcomers to get enthusiastic, get uh, public, you know, put themselves right. out there, stuff like that um, builds the community. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it. here's what I always say to people. Um, there, Anytime you get a movement going, it, it isn't about the two or three people that are the hardest core and all that. It's about the ancillary people that you get who also get enthusiastic about it. That's how mm -hmm. you build the momentum. Mm -hmm. And so I always look at it like anybody that's genuinely passionate about this. And I mean, I don't know about you. But the first tub of mushrooms I grew, I literally, I swear to God, I must have felt like the the caveman that first invented fire. Yeah, like, yeah. I thought I did the most miraculous fucking thing I, I've <laughs> ever done in my life. And, and honestly, I, it's not quite that good anymore. But it's still, it never gets old seeing a, a tub of healthy, happy mushrooms or a tub of weird mutant blobs i mean yeah. I, it, it's just fun to have an intimate relationship with a thing that's growing and it doesn't care about you you know it, mm -hmm. it doesn't know i'm there i'm tricking it into doing all sorts of things but it's yeah it's it, <laughs> right oh yeah we, we've it. talked about that yes <laughs> um but uh, but how do you not want people who are enthusiastic about it? Those people are going to read the books. They're going to read the the white paper articles. They're going to go, I don't know about genetics. And Julian said a bunch of shit on uh, Michael Geeky's podcast that I didn't know what the hell he was saying, but I'm going to read some books and I'm going to learn it. And that's exactly yes. all that matters. I, I think what's great about mushrooms for me is that I've had that experience multiple times, right? I've had that experience mm -hmm. when I, had my first successful grow and I saw those mushrooms and I was so enthusiastic that I, that I did that, that I created that all on my own. Yeah. Um, and you know, additionally, uh, I have that experience when I walk into, uh, when I first walked into a grow room full of 400 pounds of oyster mushrooms that I was growing yeah. at a, at a facility, you know, like that's like, wow, we really worked all this time to produce this enormous flush that we're going to be able to feed, tons of people at 15 farmers markets this week, you know? Right. Um, so uh, that was, you know, an amazing, and, and also um, when my friend like Humboldt fungi took me out into the forest, um, he's such an amazing person. And like walking out into the forest with him was <clears throat> another one of those moments where I just thought like, right. wow, I, I'm, I'm inspired. I just, I feel motivated to go out and do it again. 
I am in awe of what the fact that I was able to pull out dozens of pounds of right. beautiful mushrooms that I was able to turn into some of the most amazing food I've had. Yeah. Yep. Enthusiasm. <laughs> it's, it's contagious. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Um, so, okay. So I feel like uh, everybody watching has a little more of a sense of who you are, how long you've been grown. I actually didn't know uh, that you had such an extensive background in gourmets. That's very cool. That's assuming I can carve out enough space in my, my basement here. Mm -hmm. my, my plan is to get me a Martha tent going so I can, so I can do some more gourmets myself. But anyway, the reason we're all here, mm -hmm. um, let's start walking through uh, your journey with breeding. So what were, were the first ways, the first text that you used, successes, yes. failures, walk me through that journey of learning that, that brings you up to the stuff that you're doing today. Yeah, so initially it was sort of two-pronged. It was um, an inspiration by reading about Roger Rabbit, um, using supposedly using snake venom to, you know, hybridize mushrooms um, without using monokaryotic mycelium, right? Without using single right. spore isolates, he was able to take just live mycelium of two mushrooms and use this to, uh, to cross them. So from that, I was sort of figuring, you know, the more I researched into it, the more I figured like, I don't really want to be messing with highly toxic materials. And especially if I'm going to be doing it in a gourmet mushroom farm, I don't want to be bringing a poison into an organic facility. Um, uh, you can't do that under the certifications, right? Um, so, um, that began me trying to search for a way to go around that and, and do it with other materials and also a more traditional way of breeding. So I, I, that's when I started really digging in and feeling like, okay, I'm going to use cereal dilution to get one spore and I'm going to take that one spore that germinates and I'm going to pair it with another single spore germination and just start using a microscope and look at all the, um, and yeah, so that's how I really like began my journey. And from there, so um, you you were cereal dilution out of the gate. You were not. Yeah. You were not ghetto crossing. You no. were not. You were not smash crossing. You were. Yeah. Coming my, at it at, my, at that basis. Okay. Yeah, my first ever cross is is one that's a little unstable, and I've I've it's honestly it's been two years, and I've never really gotten it to uh, be at a point where I want to sell it, but. Um, it's, I call it Sammy and it's a golden teacher, Kosamoy cross. Um, okay. and it produced these beautiful variegated, um, caps that had, uh, non pigmented and pigmented spirals on the caps. Um, as well as very interesting variegation in the gills as well. Um, and I, uh, point is that was the first one I, I created with, okay. um, with cereal dilution after that, I started thinking like, well, this uses so many plates. It's, it's very time consuming. So I started playing around with the ghetto swabs. I started, mm -hmm. um, I started playing around with smashing. Um, and when it came down to those methods, however you break it down, they're not verifiable really as right. to um, successful crosses. So it became this game of like getting something that looks like a good success and then just feeling anxious about whether or not it was real or whether I'm, you know, selling snake oil. And then I just right. didn't want to be in that area. So I, I sure. um, have been working on developing that smash tech um, using like um, different pHs in the media, different mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and to make it more um, slower growing, mm -hmm. to make it easier to see the hyphal tips uh, fusing together. Um, things like that, but sure. it's it's something that I only recommend to people who want to play around and don't really care whether or not they, you know, I wouldn't sell it as a new culture or anything, but like right. if you want to make something for yourself, mess around with it, find out, write it down, you know, it's, it's really um, part of science, right, is experimenting, so... Yeah, and if at the end of the day, if even if I can't, let's say that I take two significantly different looking fruits mm -hmm. and I use a ghetto cross method or I use a smash cross method mm -hmm. and my resulting fruit looks like what I would expect. It has traits from, you know, both morphologies both mm -hmm. and, and I can repeatedly get that. Mm -hmm. I mean... You can assume who fucking that cares. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's cool. People mm -hmm. aren't buying 
buying the stuff because it's verifiable. They're mm -hmm. they're buying it because it's uh, reliable. Yeah, and it it's cool and they want it. Like yeah. for example, uh, my example, I use this as an example, like starry nights, right? Sure. Like if we've, I've grown starry nights, you've probably grown starry nights and mine never looked as cool as the amazing cool picture of starry nights that right. made me absolutely bonkers and say, I just <laughs> got to grow this fruit. Right. Right. So I would have been happier probably and would probably have kept wanting to grow it if, and there are other vendors that have these spectacular photos mm -hmm. and people are buying it based on those spectacular photos. Right. Right. And then what they're growing rarely looks like that. Or maybe once in a blue moon looks kind of like that. Right. I mean, is there really, is there a problem with, because I think a lot of people are just, like you said, your initial reaction to cer cereal dilutions was fuck, this is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And there's some people that are not as hardcore as we are. It doesn't mean they don't love, mushrooms they're right. they don't have the time or the money or whatever whatever it is yeah but they got a they got a q-tip and they got mm -hmm. some mushrooms they can swab and they can give it a go and see what happens yes i mean i would still encourage people to do that and if you got sure. lucky yeah. out of a hundred times and you did invent something amazing and it's reliable yeah congratulations we're all gonna want it for yeah. sure but what 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 your instinct is, and this is the instinct of Yoshi, who's going to be on next week. This is the instinct of Kylor and Julian. All these guys that seem to be hardcore into this, they want to really know, mm -hmm. right? That you're really you're really crossing them. You want yeah. the you want the paternity test, right? Yeah, like, you want to you know, know who the father is. Partially for my sanity, just because right. I will be constantly questioning myself and wondering and also just because um you know it's it's a little anxiety thing it's a little sure. bit of like i'm afraid I, i'm afraid people will see me as an imposter sometimes yep. because i've done all this work and sometimes sometimes i just don't see myself as as uh in the know as as maybe i am with some of sure. these things um so uh, so yeah that's that anxiety really drove me to be like yep. i need to make this right i need to make sure that my crosses are provable and, and all that stuff and i get the the idea that that that's not necessary um right. it's it's a little bit of just my own problem right it's it's i'm sure. improving it basically just yeah. for myself um so yeah no i uh i think it's great for people to start doing ghetto ghetto swabs and stuff i highly recommend that i do recommend uh swab the fresh fruit try not to do um cross uh, uh, ghetto swab crosses with like dried spores sure. um, that are on like a spore print or something. Um, juicy, yeah, juicy spores. Best. You want the juicy yes. spores. Yes. They'll germinate at the same time. Okay. They'll, they'll be in closer proximity to each other and they'll be more ready to actually uh, exchange DNA. Right. So the trick then is, cause I don't know about you, but I can have, you know, let's say five varieties going at one time and they are all going to fruit when they feel like it. Yes. So, so I mean, do they really have to be absolutely that moment still in the substrate? Or, like, is there no. a range? Like, within a week? Or, because, um, I mean, they, they dry out. A swab's going to dry out in a day, right? Yeah. I mean, I generally, what I do is, is I, I swab. Yeah, I just pull the fruits out of the tub. And then mm -hmm. I swab one. And then I pull the fruit out of the tub. And I swab the other um so you so, do need to ideally you really they're they're fresh they yeah for, yeah okay ideal ideally fresh um you can do it the other way around but i mean the point that i'm just trying to make about the fresh spores is that um uh spores that have dried out are more in a defensive mode where they're yeah. going to take a longer time to germinate and maybe they won't germinate as together because some may mm -hmm. be more or less ready to germinate whereas the fresh ones are just ready to go ready to go so when you they're like a 19 year old at the bar he's yeah. going home with anybody doesn't yeah. care whereas the other ones have had their heart broken a few times exactly. maybe maybe a divorce or two they're <laughs> they're like their walls are up they're like no yeah. no okay exactly so so um it's just to say that you'll have a little bit more success with the fresher spores yeah okay. um and then with the smash tech i do um, I would even recommend like, if you can get monocaryons, if you can get single spore isolations, 
if you smash those together, I think using that technique with that may even increase the compatibility oh, doing okay. haploid pairings, right? Okay. Um, so like that may be something you could even add to um, serial dilutions, you know, if you want to okay. uh, increase your, your chances with serial dilutions. Um, so just smash your cereals. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, rather than putting them next to each other. Rather than putting the next okay. and then allowing to okay. grow, I would take them face to face, uh, mm -hmm. the mycelium face to face, and put them touching each other, plate mm -hmm. it, and you'll still be able to see the the barriers in between where they're growing. Sure. They'll grow outwards on the sides, and then you'll see whether they sector or they they okay. don't. Um, and so, what you're looking for, they're going to grow. They're going to do their own thing, mm -hmm. but but pretty rapidly there should be i'm assuming because i have seen many pictures and it's typically uh the the monocarians are wispier yes. very uniform yes. whereas the minute you got the secondary uh hyphal growth it seems to sorry it seems to thicken up and then uh, tends to it go does a little more, more things yeah. yeah it tends to yeah. go a little more isomorphic or show a little bit more more variance in growth um speed okay. and shape yeah um it's it's again, like I'm sort of a nerd about, about proving it. So like for me, I don't really worry about what it looks like. I, mm -hmm. I take the mycelium from where, where it looks like it is where they're touching, you know, or sure. where they're close to each other. Mm -hmm. I take the mycelium from in between there and I just look at it under a microscope. Um, and from there, the monokaryotic mycelium should not have clamp connections. Now it doesn't, it doesn't have to not have clamp connections, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't have clamp connections um which are these little bridge like connections mm -hmm. between the mm -hmm. yeah exactly little connections between the mycelium so when they touch right. you should be able to see a little bridge that forms um mm -hmm. and that would tell you okay this is a, a successful pairing um and further from that you would have to test it to see does that mean that the traits are right. mixed right because right. it still you have uh quite quite the dice roll in what traits are going to be inherited and what traits are going to be actually expressed. Right. Uh, now I have a question for you. Uh, somebody on my discord was asking me today. Um, he, so he said, I got the scope. Uh, I guess he's done some work in uh, cannabis industry with breeding and whatnot and is, is trying to learn, uh, learn it from mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And he was like, man, you know what there is not a lot of is like the fungal microscopy techniques. Mm -hmm. And so he was asking specifically, like, how do you look at mycelium? Because mm. by the time I get it on a plate, it tends to clump up and yes. I can't see anything. So I said, well, my understanding, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. I said, take a chunk. And then if you can get like a nice little razor blade, you can cut little slices and then just set those suckers down on, on the, and maybe some of them are not going to look good, but right. eventually you'll get some that look good. Um, um, is that roughly? Yeah, that's roughly what, what I would do. At. Yeah. So what I tend to do, um, and I struggled with this for a long time and, um, Miss Mush, uh, SoCal actually did give me some tips that helped me out, which cool. was pouring thinner plates and um, just not using any coloring in it. Um, okay. So you pour like a nice, thin, very clear plate. And what I'll do is when I go to take my transfer, I take my scalpel and I just cut horizontally underneath the, oh. so I'm just separating the top layer of mycelium off. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, so you're like, keeping a little bit of the agar still a little bit of the agar, but it's real see-through. You mm -hmm. put that on your, on your, um, slide right slide. Yeah. And bear. You can, you can no, no cover bear. slip, no yeah. cover slip. Um, now have you used, cause Tim sells uh, a lot of gel and gum. I still buy his gel and gum mixes. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're so crystal clear. That's I've been thinking idea. so. Yeah. I like that idea of the thinner plates because mm -hmm. then I can just put it on the compound microscope. I don't got to mm -hmm. buy because I've been thinking, do I need another microscope now? Yeah. I mean, I can I barely could afford the first one I got. Absolutely. So so I like that idea. That's a good, clever way. Make your yeah. plates as clear as possible. Pour them thin. Or I guess you wouldn't even have to pour them thin you if you were just really. able to cut yeah. enough of that off. For me, pouring them thin just sort of helps me uh... – it just sort of helps me make sure that I'm not getting a, a thicker transfer that's harder to like work around. Sure. But um, it, it, it's just whatever works best for you. If, if right. you can just reach in there, slice it straight out of the plate, real thin. Um, if you have a better time taking the transfer out, turning it on its side and cutting it down like that, mm -hmm. all good. 
with the gel and gum, I highly suggest using, if you're going to be using gel and gum for imaging, use a higher rate of gel and gum. Um, so you might want to use for the, like the premix that tip of the cap cells, you might want to use like 10 or 12 grams of that per liter sure. instead of eight, because, um, right. the firmness of it will make sure that it's not sort of like jelly on the slide right. and it, it holds its shape. It's firm. Yeah. See, I actually buy his wet mix specifically for germinating spores, mm -hmm. but in that case you would want the, you would want more of it in there. More of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's thicker. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. That is cool. That's a good tip. I will be using that tip. Absolutely. Of the cap tip. <laughs> um, oh, and, sorry. And, Keep uh, I do. I do media form. I have a media formulation document on my Patreon. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I plan on doing a lot more on, you know, media formulation, isolation, stuff like that. So if anybody ever needs to uh, check that out as a resource, I, I hope uh, it'll be good for people because gel and gum can be a little bit rough. Um, it's hard to make it yourself. I do suggest yeah. buying the premix because 100%. it requires very specific things in order for it to set right. Um, and in order for it to even like gel in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, I've read a lot of Facebook posts about people trying and my response is always, just go to tip of the cap, go to agarnow.com, just buy that stuff. It's so good. I couldn't, I, I mean, it's just optically absolutely optically, yeah, yeah. It's clear. like glass. Yeah. It is it's like, like glass. glass. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for gel and gum, it is, it is preferable for uh, germinating spores because of the moisture content. For me, it tends to hold that moisture really well. And um, I do still to this day on plates will get plates that just deaden the water, maybe two, yeah. three plates swabbed and uh, nothing comes up on agar. So when I run it on gel and gum, way better results. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, also for um, crosses, like after I started experimenting with the um, smash crossing and um, ghetto swabbing and stuff like that. I, um, like I said, I was really sort of like, I wanted to prove um, techniques and stuff. So um, I, as I, uh, as I researched more, I started to find more and more papers that were focused around filamentous fungi and yeast and bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, I was recommended a few from some people um, and Basically, this was sort of where that initial inspiration of wanting to use the snake venom converged with um, sort of wanting to get around the uh, tediousness of, of uh, serial dilution, stuff like that. Um, and I really figured out that um, mushrooms have an ability to exchange DNA um, between them. Uh, their mycelium has the ability to exchange nuclei between them. Um, in order to create like novel substrains, it's hard to describe all of this without using a lot of terminology. So sure. I'll try and break the things down sort of as, as layman as possible. But um, if, you know, anybody ever has any questions about what any terminology means, um, you can always, you know, check it out. I have a document on my Patreon. You can always hit me up in my DMs on Instagram. I can send you some resources. I want people to learn on their own too. If they want access to any of the research papers or anything that I use, please do contact me. Um, so uh, what I found was a chemical that acts very similarly to, um, well, maybe not acts very similarly, but um, it accomplishes the goal that I wanted with the snake venom, right? So I found a mixture of chemicals um, to make a buffer solution that when you place my two dicaryotic mycelium samples in it um, and undergoes a specific reaction, um, it will essentially, uh, sorry, hold on, let me, um, so the hyphae that are in this solution while they're undergoing the reaction, they come in contact with each other so this is the tips of the the, the two different. Now we're talking about two separate, uh, yeah, we dicaryons. Have a container. Yeah, two two separate dicaryons. We have a okay. little. Oh, this is our micro centrifuge tube. I'm just making it a sort mm -hmm. of a bigger area to, for for ease. So our micro centrifuge tube. We have these two samples we put inside of it. Um, 
in a buffer solution and they're just floating around in the buffer solution. Okay. Uh, I'll do something like pestle them. So I'll use a sterile mm -hmm. pestle, which is just a thing to smash all of them. Smush them up. Okay. And that just increases the surface area of, of it touching all of it. So now you're not in a little micro centrifuge tube. You're just scraping off mycelium then, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, so I'll no take... agar in there. It's just you're getting a little wad. Yeah, okay. So I'll you're just a getting a wad of it. Yeah. Put it in there. Okay. And I'll just scrape on the surface with a scalpel. And yep, then I'll okay. put that into my micro centrifuge tube. Both of the strains, the buffer solution, and uh, it undergoes its its reaction. Um, during that time, all the hyphae are touching each other, all the tips of the mycelium. They're mm -hmm. touching each other and they're floating freely around each other. Um, right. And when they come in contact, they are actually able to undergo what's called anastomosis. Mm -hmm. It's a fusion of the tips of the hyphae together. Okay. Um, and from there, they they then send signals to each other or, or and, and as well as the, the reaction mechanically forces them to uh, undergo what's called nuclear migration. So sure, yeah. the septum, which is just this mm -hmm. little unit that closes off the hyphal tip, um, it opens in between each of them and one nuclei from each section uh, section of the mycelium swaps. Okay. So now so it it's honestly mm -hmm. sort of akin. I mean, the, the, the specifics a little different, but it's not terribly different than what a clamp is doing where the clamp is moving in one direction, but when they split, it, it, it allows the other one to go backward after exactly. the septum has been formed. But exactly. in this case, what you're saying is, they're because you've mechanically combined them. Mm -hmm. This buffer solution is just allowing for the tips to literally come together and, and have nuclei migrate yes. into each and other. And they don't okay. have to, but they can form clamp connections between each other through this process, okay. as well as the nuclear migration, which mm -hmm. is the main thing is, is the, right. the septa opening and the passing of the nuclei between each other. So from there, a mycelium, both of the mycelium are individual, like they're, they're the same because they both mm -hmm. contain half the DNA from each of each other, right? right? But they, there may be segments of all of this mycelium floating around doing these exchanges mm -hmm. that are slightly different in the way that the, that the nuclei may interact with each other, right? right. That the actual information may express itself or come together. Sure. Um, so what you do from there, from there is you should have a fairly uniform growing mycelium, but mm -hmm. you do want to uh, streak out that mycelium and test out a few testers. And that's really what I do is just one generation of like four or five testers from there, checking out, making sure there's no sectoring and everything. And so now this is growing on. So once you create this and that happens over however long a period of time, you're then transferring some of that onto a plate. You're like streaking mm -hmm. a plate. Yeah, yeah. I'll take like an inoculation loop and use that to pull mycelium out okay. and then move it across the plate. Now, I mean, it's not doing that everywhere, right? So don't you have to figure out which is the new thing and which is the old? It should be doing that everywhere. All of the mycelium oh, it should. should be, okay. It should be undergoing the same process. Okay. Um, but like I was explaining, the process may be the resulting process uh, outcome of the process may be slightly di varied between all of the individual cells that are doing this. Right. Okay. Um, and maybe not all of them are, but um, actually undergoing the process, but the majority of them will. Right. So okay. when you're streaking this mycelium, you're looking for variant, very varied growth. Right. Okay. So if I see varied growth, I see sectors, mycelium, not growing into each other, forming mm -hmm. a barrier between each other right. or, um, one, one growth of rhizomorphic, one growth of tomatose right next to each other. Mm -hmm. I'll separate those onto different plates with transfers, isolate them into, uh, so that they're only growing one way, you know, and sure. each type of growth and then test those out. And you'll see through the actual, um, traits that are expressed, you'll say, was this one, the result that I desire is this one, the result that I desire is this one, the result that I desire. But from that one tube. Yes. It should just be one resulting genetic is the, and idea. in my, and in okay. my experience, it is one resulting genetic. Um, okay. but yeah, it, it's, it's a question as to, um, how the genes actually express themselves. Right. Uh, based so, on the different. Uh, so it's yeah. your belief. They're always anastomatizing or whatever the word would be. They're, they're always yeah. doing that. 
in creating a new genetic. But my thought is, so if I have four nuclei, right, I have two nuclei from two different varieties and they're doing that, I'm just like in my head, I'm going, so how do I go from having four nuclei to having, I should just have two in, in the new right. resulting dicarion, well, right? So they so, both exchange one, right, into the other. So they okay. both end up with two dissimilar nuclei. So they start oh, with two everyone, so, Oh, it's like full swap. It's an orgy, yeah. They're it's all, an orgy, they're all okay. It's everyone's, nobody's fucking yes. their own wife, I get it. <laughs> Got it. I'm with you now. Um, okay. Full nuclear orgy. It's it's a yes, it's a beautiful a process. Orgy. And afterwards, um, they uh, they should be it should be a single su uh, substrain, but you may have variance in growth and sectoring. So it, you know you do a little isolation. Then you afterwards. would have to do that. Okay. And the uh, science behind it is that these two dissimilar nuclei, they are supposed to fuse like the similar nuclei in a normal mycelium does. Okay. When that mushroom pops out of the substrate and it starts growing. The moment that that veil mm -hmm. drops, those gills are, are at work making uh, right. spores in the basidia. Well, right. what are they doing to make those spores? The cells in the basidia, what they're doing is they're splitting. Um, right. The nuclei, sure. are they're fusing, and then they're splitting into four. Um, and those okay. are the spores that sit in the basidia, right? So our, our, our goal is we hope that these two dissimilar nuclei do that. They fuse they're gotcha. compatible, they split into four, they create spores that are um, homogenous in their DNA. Their DNA is gotcha. the same throughout them with the genetic variants within the tetrapolar mating system. And, right? and, and that buffer is just that good. Because, okay, I got a question from, this is from two weeks ago, Julian, who was on talking about his uh, DDK solution. So this is a totally mm -hmm. different solution. But he says... Uh, uh, what makes the two nuclei types swap specifically to the other two in a perfect ratio? And, and correct me if I'm wrong. It's just the idea that that whatever that buffer is, is just completely working on all levels for that swap. Yeah. So what's happening here is that, I mean, I, I can't tell you exactly the reason with 100 percent confidence. But from mm -hmm. my understanding, what what should be happening is that one of the chemicals in this solution is making the cell wall, one of the cell walls, the outer cell wall. Um, weaken or break very down. Weak. Yes, right. weaken, okay. break down, possibly have like permeations in it. Sure. Um, and this allows DNA to slip out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So this will allow the nuclear exchange between uh, the, the exchange of the nuclei. Um, and uh, the other chemical in the solution is stabilizing the cells. Because when DNA is able to fall out of cells, often it will want to dissolve the cell. Completely right? uh, dissolve. Basically okay. a, apoptose, right? Like, um, gotcha. and, uh, and so. You're like, those... you're like roofing the, the hyphae, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you don't them... want it to completely pass out, but right. you want to have total control over it. I right. Get it. You're, get, okay. you're getting them comfy. Sure. Um, sure. And so that solution is a stabilizer. It stabilizes the cells, okay. makes sure that they're not going to collapse. Um, and so that's what's allowing the information to safely transfer between them. But what okay. ends up with two nuclei in each um, septated unit, I'm not entirely sure, but I would guess the um, I get I would guess it's actually a function of the mycelium itself. I don't mm -hmm. think having more than two nuclei would be it might be possible, but I do think the mycelium has a mechanism of accepting the correct number of nuclei, I think. And sure. Or there I might mean, there needs to be a reason that that happens like a, an error. Sure. You know? I'm thinking out loud. Tell me, uh, I'm going to totally play a Donald Trump here. I'm going to just spitball an idea. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're weakening the cell wall enough to allow nuclear information to slip out and go other places, mm -hmm. then is it also possible that in that process, at the end of the day, some nuclear information is just not making it back anywhere. Yes. And so, so the result is that at the end of the day, there will be two nuclei there. Yeah. But some of those just don't make it back to their home, too. Absolutely. Is, is my, you, my you will thinking. Have, you will have dead colonies. Yeah, you will have dead right. colonies and you'll have like... Um, I, I don't know. I sort of just call it like um, noise or like uh, trash inside of the solution. Um, sure. And that's just like dead DNA that doesn't mm -hmm. really have potential for life. Um, 
So yeah, when you plate, you'll find some weird interactions on those plates sometimes. Sometimes I've had very strange discoloration from possibly like a um, transcription error or something sure. in, the, in the DNA that's super causing. funky stuff. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the, the reason that I do this method um, is the advantageous part of it is I'm using less plates, I'm using less, right. I'm making less of all of these things at once. You know, it's, it's just a one little thing that goes into a big bioreaction tube that sits right. in liquid culture for a little while. And instead of like 40 plates, you know, um, and you've completely dodged the, the spore bullet. Right. Same, but, same with Julian's method is you 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 don't got to start with spores. Right. But I do want to warn people, um, this is not a magic bullet and it's not going to work every single time. You know, mushrooms are still living beings that are very complex and messing with their DNA sure. can have very complex results. So, um, so now I mean, when you say it doesn't work every time, what happens? Nothing grows on the plate? Or uh, I've, I've had, uh, I've had chimera -ism before, I guess if that's a real word, but like, uh, okay. I've had uh, an organism that's a chimera. So it's, uh, it grows as one single mycelia on the plate. You can isolate mm -hmm. it. looks like a monoculture, but then once you put it to grains, once you put it to sub and it starts Doesn't. fruiting, it fruits two completely different mushrooms in the same space. I see. Um, and yeah, so, um, there are, you can, you can have, um, organisms that have too much dna inside of them right like mm -hmm. uh, i believe so so like in, in my in my imagination or sort of in my understanding i'm thinking like um a cell is is receiving these two nuclei that are dissimilar they're unable to undergo karyogamy right so they're unable sure. to fuse and then it's just got these two dissimilar nuclei and it tries to undergo osmosis with, or, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, it tries to undergo, um, what am I thinking Me of? Meiosis. Uh, yeah, uh, no. meiosis. Yeah, meiosis. <laughs> sorry, I'm tired, I'm blanking. It's okay. Uh, and split these two dissimilar nuclei, which have not enough DNA to split into sure. four pieces each. Right. And then you get that problem, right? Yeah. Um, some of the spores in the basidia are just one, one genetic. Some of the spores in the basidia are just another sure. genetic. Um, so, yeah. so, so you'll always get mycelium. It's just whether, so like you say, so you still, no matter what, you got to do the whole fruiting process. Mm -hmm. You got to look at everything and it, yeah, it, it is. Way. It is. Um, I guess it is less convenient a little bit in that way and that it takes a little longer to a hundred percent prove. But um, it definitely it's shorter on the plastics and shorter on all the wasteable materials and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. It, with with like a ser serial dilutions and pairing uh, haploids, you can probably tell without fruiting them. Like this is this is not going to be just one or the other, right? It's going to be a cross. So uh, somebody just asked a, a question, and I think it actually speaks to the chimera ism idea sure. of you're getting these two different fruits you can do this whole thing and can they just not swap or swap the wrong stuff and yeah. so um, you're not is... really always getting that perfect swap Correct. but that's the goal is that this process allows for that to happen yeah there's and, not and my goal is also to improve it over time right sure. this is just uh yeah a makeshift conglomeration of techniques that were used to do plasmid insertion. Other stuff. Yeah. Sure. Um, with other organisms. Um, so, um, so you're doing the groundbreaking early research in this area is what's going uh, on. Yes. You could say that. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's great. I mean, this, that's exactly what I'm all about. Uh, I, I, the first time I heard somebody get an attitude about, oh, people call themselves mycologists. Yeah, of course. You know, I don't have a PhD. You don't have a mm -hmm. PhD in mycology. Where the fuck do you even get a PhD in mycology? Not too many places no, from my understanding. Not many. So realistically, we are all just at home citizen scientists yeah. trying to do something fun, but use science to do it or not. But hopefully we are. And there's no reason you can't be doing that. And 
absolutely on a limited budget it's not going to look the same as if you're yeah. a well-funded mycologist working for some industry you know that makes 10 million dollars a month selling their strain of whatever mushroom they sell like, yeah no i'm absolutely we're doing the best we can yeah i'm absolutely um you know i've been doing this a long time but i'm not really that big of a guy is in terms of like finance or anything like that sure. you know i just i work with what i got um you know, I, I've been working with this two by two foot by two foot wooden buffed up flow hood for the last four sure. years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, anybody can can get into it and you don't have to have a lot to make some really cool stuff happen and, and get into some really advanced areas of this field. Um, you just have to have the interest and the intrigue. And um, the thing I think if anybody really wants to get deep into mycology, deep into breeding or anything like that is uh, they should learn how to learn. Um, that is the yep. most important thing that I have done that enables me to um, specialize in anything that I want. I, I have always felt this way that I can go into mushrooms, I can go into agriculture, I can go into you know uh, marketing, I can go into anything that I want and learn sure. proficiently how to do it. Now I have my pitfalls and stuff, but um, right. it's all about knowing how to read something digest that information properly and use it in your life without, you know, um, sort I'm of with you. just feeling better about it and, and not implementing, you know, I tell everybody, uh, who seems very enthusiastic and hungry to learn. Mm -hmm. I just say, Hey man, hey, do you got a community college in your area? They probably mm -hmm. have a microbiology class. Um, go take one. They're cool. I took a couple. I, I, I had to take one for a degree I was getting, but the other one I took just because I had so much fun in the first first one. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot of cool stuff. I could identify a, a microbe mm -hmm. after my first class. You oh, can yeah. give me any microbe. And if I have the gear in the lab, I can 99% of the time identify it for you. Absolutely. And that, and like you said, your story has a similar thing where you learned how to do something on a professional level. And mm -hmm. you were able to then translate that into your at home work. So mm -hmm. I'm with you. I think people should be exposed to more of that uh, education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, and appreciate that. I, I don't know how you, I mean, I want to, I went to Montessori school. That whole angle was like the learner and the student or the teacher and the student are in the same body and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, anybody, sh I mean, if anything, you would hope education teaches you how to teach yourself things. Absolutely. So yeah, the more education you get, the better for sure. Um, I want to pop this up real quick. Julian uh, also said, as long as you're using science to study mushrooms, then you can get away with calling yourself a mycologist. I like that. I'm, I'm with it. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent all about bringing on people who talk to me about papers and read journal articles and use words that I have to look up instant way to get me to like you use a word i gotta go fucking look up in a in a <laughs> dictionary i'm like i like this guy he knows a word i don't know yeah i want i want to know that word and and that's another important part is that I, I i highly recommend people surround themselves with people who know better than them um i uh, you know a lot of people will call me s smart or you know a lot of my friends will introduce me by saying like oh hey this is the the mushroom guy he knows all yeah. about mushrooms but the only reason I know shit about mushrooms is because I found people who really knew about mushrooms and really had more passion than me, more drive than me. And, and I put myself around them and, uh, and I learned how to hone my drive, how to hone my passion, how to, uh, actually learn. Um, I, I would not be here if I, you know, and, and, and another thing is that like, I do have a little bit, you know, myself, a little bit of something that's, that's unique, which is that, I'm a little bit obsessed with learning. I'm a little OCD about learning everything I can, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, I think anybody can sort of find the people around them that inspire them to want to do sort of the same thing. Um, even if you're not as good at like being the, the encyclopedia guy. Cause I, I, you know, I sort of just memorize things. <laughs> it's, um, I do me. not memorize things, but I like to learn things and then forget them rapidly if I don't use them. That is my superpower. Um, sorry, I was trying to figure out a technical issue here. No worries. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you. I'm pretty much the same way. Oh, Don, he knows a little something about everything. Mm -hmm. um, but 
it's just because I actually care and I, I want to learn some stuff. So yeah. I, I'm with you. Like, there's nothing, if I want to figure it out, I'm not going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so, so back to this journey and, and mm. you figured out this cool buffer. Mm hmm. And you have, so I'm going to tell you the first thing that I ever uh, saw that got me interested going, I got to check out Wumbo, is uh, your Avalanche. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. So um, the Avalanche was probably the first one. I think it was the, yeah, it was the first one I did using this uh, recombination method. Um, it was using a mushroom that I called Melmac Revert at the time, which I, you know, maybe fair enough. It's, you could call it Melmac Revert, but to me it grows more just like a penis envy with a tendency to get a little large and wrinkly. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Yeti, um, Yeti is one of my favorites, probably <clears throat> one of the most potent cubensies that I've ever tested. Um and uh, I've always had a bit of an issue with the isolations that I've drawn of it. Um, I've had a bit of an issue getting it to fruit prolifically uh, and have nice flushes. So I crossed it with the Melmac Revert, which was one for me that always filled out tubs, always filled out canopies. And um, I got Avalanche, with, which to me is my personal favorite right now. It's dense, but not too dense. It's not so dense that it'll take days and days to dehydrate. Um, it grows tall, but not too tall. It never touches the top of my bags or my tubs. You know, they're nice seven inch or so fruits. Um, a nice, beautiful cap that takes a long time to open and doesn't really drop spores. So it's it's a dream for me and extraordinarily potent too. <laughs> uh, it looks good. I know that. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't, I can tell you this. I would say if you take 10 times that somebody wants to tell me about a vigorous awesome genetic mm -hmm. i'm telling you at least a third of the time it, it's it's yours so mm -hmm. you're, you're definitely doing something right um and i uh, i mean i i don't think there's anybody else with the exception of maybe like the dc mac line of melmax that just no one ever you know no one goes well that was a disappointing grow right um, People love that stuff. But yeah, I've I'm, I've heard I'm, a lot of rave reviews about it, and I'm super. I appreciate your your kind words, and I'm, I'm I love the support around it. Yeah, it is pretty great, and, and your Patreon is great, um, and, and you are accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people I remember early on in my my mycology journey, uh, you DM somebody and they would just never respond to you. And you're mm -hmm. like, wow, I don't know. Are you like, and then every once in a while, these days, this is my favorite. People will have um, like a story post on Instagram and it'll be like, sorry if I'm not getting back to you. You know, I get like 5,000 messages a day mm -hmm. and I'm just like, Bill Gates doesn't get 5,000 messages yeah. a day. Like, come on, dude. So anyway, I really appreciated it. You've always, if I ask like a random question out of the blue, just literally... I won't be like, hey, how you doing? Hope things yeah. are good on your end. I'll just be like, tell me this. I have this one very specific question and you, you know, you just answer it. So. Yeah, I, I love to help people out with questions. I am I am sort of the type of person who um, I will answer as many questions as I can, but sometimes I will like open someone's message and then I'll be working on something and I'll get super distracted and I'll not text back. So, you know, never get, never get a uh, feeling any type of way if I don't uh, answer your question, because I do want to um, just send me a message to remind me that you're there. Um, and yeah, I love, I love chatting people up, love talking to people. Um, I especially like questions that are more pointed towards actually learning about the mushrooms. The questions that I do sure. dislike are things that are more like, what is the most potent mushroom or what is the best yielding or fastest growing? Like right. those questions, like I get the desire to ask the question, but, um, I just feel like it shows a little bit of uh, less interest in the actual mushroom and more in like the profit you're, you're, you're trying to make out of it or something like that. Wait, um, hold on. Wait, mushrooms are profitable. Wait. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's not something I'm interested in. <laughs> not sure. Yeah. But, um, but like for me, the passion lies in, they look cool. Which one looks cool? Which one grows in strange ways? Which one has different right. spore color? Which one, you know, I, I want people to be interested in the actual mushroom 
what do they do? What do they look like? You know, we can always talk about whether it's fast or slow sometimes, but um, when your first question is, what's the yield on this one? I know why you're asking right. me that. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yep. And other interesting questions throughout the day that, that I'm sure we all get. Yes. Um, Those are fun questions. Uh, so what are you working on right now? Uh, right now I'm actually working on um, crossing land race strains into some of my more worked stuff because okay. we always have been talking, you know, other geneticists and I have always been talking about what happens when you take all these crosses so, so, so far out, you know, this cross right. with this cross with this, and they're all so domesticated. I feel like at a certain point, your ge genetics are going to start getting a little weak or the variation is going to get yeah. low. And I want to introduce more variation into some of my genetics to see some wild stuff I can find. So I've taken uh, wild treasure coast um, and I've crossed that with avalanche, albino trinity, um, a ape revert, a bunch of others. Um, and so far I've tested the albino trinity wild treasure coast and the avalanche wild treasure coast. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. They're coming out with these beautiful rubbery thick stipes, these nice, fat caps that don't tend to open so quickly, but you know, they almost have like a cross on the top of them from like cracking okay. a little bit. Um, beautiful. That is you a know. cool new trait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that trait and the tablecloth trait, which is like the ODPE and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. the, those are the two hot new traits that uh, mm -hmm. well, once, once you get like the plasmid insertion in recombinant DNA, stuff <laughs> figured out, that, then you can just shove that trait into, into, into anything. Like, yeah. That'll be cool. Um, so, yeah, and that seems to be something we talked about a couple weeks ago. The idea of, uh, I think Kyler called it a bottlenecking, like of the tat genetics mm -hmm. that, yeah. that seemed to be sort of inbreeding itself to death. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was trying to do some of that as well. Mm -hmm. I know Yoshi is also doing a lot of um, other cubensis, not, or, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, other uh, philosophies, not cubensis. Yeah. For, for the same reason, just to try to get get some hopefully some more vigor and just variation some, some new stuff mm -hmm. going on yep um, um i got a question for you from yeah. uh phil arid uh would you consider doing any wood lover or have you uh i've worked with wood lovers before they're really easy to grow psilocybe cyanescence is super common around uh north america okay. and um ovidesiata and k relescence i think you can mm -hmm. find i'm not entirely sure where you find those as much but the cyan essence you know you can just grow some spawn put it on some wood chips and sawdust um, mm -hmm. put a little potting soil on top of that plant some like wheatgrass seed and um just stick that out in your backyard water it every once in a while and you're, you're good you know nice. it'll just it'll just go and and pop uh after the last frost nice. of the season yeah I got me some Eleni. The problem is uh, I, I live in northern Ohio, so I, I probably got it late in the game. So mm -hmm. hopefully I can keep it going until next spring and uh, try to get a nice little patch going out in the back. That's the goal. Yeah, I don't want to deter anybody from taking any uh, wood lovers. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, I have always gravitated more towards like pan scions as, as, as exotics or... Mm -hmm. Um, other ones that aren't associated with the wood lovers paralysis, just because I've always felt like, you know, for me, I can grow it just as easy. I can, I don't have to go foraging in some dune grass. Um, you know, if you really want to go get a bunch of cyan essence, you probably got to forage for them. And it's, it's really roughing it foraging for cyan essence, walking through wet sand and dune grass and chopping through ice plant and stuff. It's, it's a lot. I grew up literally on the dunes overlooking Lake Michigan. And mm -hmm. You can literally cut your legs on, on dune grass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, it's rough. I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's a rough <laughs> go. Um, I got a question from Mr. Hideous. Um, you're not, though, Mr. Hideous. You're a good person. Uh, where did the name Wumbo come from? Uh, Wumbo is sort of just a silly name that I started when I was a kid, um, calling myself I Wumbo, you Wumbo on all my, all my handles. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was just because, um, uh, it's from SpongeBob. It's, it's a little joke about, uh, um, a belt that one of the characters had in SpongeBob that shrunk people wanted to turn the M to a W for Wumbo, um, and then did a little riff on that. Yeah. So, 
Um, it's so, not. That Nothing is super serious. esoteric, dude. That is, <laughs> it's very. Where did your name come from? One line from one, one episode of a show seven years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I like it. God, like, like 15 it. years ago, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, not that serious, you know, or anything. It's, it's supposed to be well, a little bit silly, but it is a, very esoteric. <laughs> it's a way cooler story than mine. How do you get your name? I'm kind of geeky I'm into mycology. Fair enough. That's that's how much thought I, you can tell I'm like middle-aged and tired. Yeah. Because my, my creative process has to be very abbreviated these days. Mm -hmm. I, I have kids yelling at me and, uh, you know, dinner to make and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, so I got a question from Harish here. Um, where can I buy some Wumbo merch? Ah. I think I can actually pull this up. If you give yeah. me one second. Okay. Oh, yeah, and you got a bunch of slides. We should look at some of these, too. But hold on. Let me get this. Uh... Yeah. I'm I'll try go. and blow through these pretty quick. But I have uh, links to everything if you need them. Um, but, yeah, I have merch on my website. I have all sorts of designs. Um, the address is www.wombogenetics.company.site. Uh, a uh, little unfortunate with the domain. I'm still trying to work that out, but um, you go there to that. Go, guys. Yeah, that's the link tree. You go to that first link and um, you'll have my website where you can buy genetics, um, all sorts of micro supplies and my merch. I got shirts. I got, uh, yeah, I got a bunch of designs on shirts and Here some other go. stuff. So I think you're wearing one of these shirts right now. Yes. So this is a uh, one of mine in the tri blends. It's a very sort of a uh, a soft sort of lightweight shirt, um, mm -hmm. and this is uh, tri blend fabric. So it's it doesn't shrink, easy to wash, really uh, breathable. And then I also have the heavyweight sort of more classic fabric shirts that I really like as well. Nice, cool. So yeah, and and then uh, for everybody watching, uh, I have below in the description um all his links so you can mm -hmm. connect with him on instagram or linktree um and uh, i think i also have the patreon link in there as well yes so 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 we'll get as far as that goes um so let's, first yeah, keep slide go, go, go. let's show that slide um which one are, dry... can, you pull, can you pull them up or i think i need to do it i think you might need to okay um, which one? I if there's yeah. Let's just go to one. Yeti. Let's just go to Yeti fruit. Uh, I think there what we go. Okay. Yeah, so that's the Yeti. Um, you can see that it's just a very dense fruit with a humongously like uh belt like dense bell shaped cap. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are uh that's the sort of the uh what do you call it the progenitor to uh um our our uh avalanche sorry yeah <laughs> losing my mind um and uh and then after that we have melmac fruit uh the melmac revert fruit um so that one too so you can see with the melmac revert like it gets really wrinkly in the stipes but it doesn't always grow like that it's more i would say epigenetic that it grows like that it's more like a response to certain growing conditions okay um but for me, the traits that I look for in this, uh, when I cross it with something, are specifically the gills. It forms are very odd shaped, um, not symmetrical, not um, concurrent. Like, like they're all like this. Yeah, like, they're yeah. wavy. They're a little messed up. The um, the spores don't drop from the gills either, even though it gets extraordinarily black in the gills okay. um, with with uh, spores. And then if you go to the avalanche fruit there. Um, uh, avalanche one. Yeah. You can see that these, and I wish I actually didn't upload the one with the gills on it, but so this one, um, you can see the stipes are nice and dense and pure white, sort of sure. like, um, the avalanche, um, the caps are real bell shaped like the avalanche, but they, they get green, this like greenish tint to the top. Um, the way that, uh, thrasher tends to or or melmac or penis envy tends to yeah. bruise on the top um 
the yield is insanely high. You know, it, it's, it's producing really nice fruits. Um, <clears throat> and that's sort of the goal that I had with this one was just to make it perform a little bit better. So I wouldn't have these little like uh, aborts all over the, the surface of the cake. Um, and to get these really desirable traits that I have of the cool looking caps, the cool looking stipes, um, the, the nice uh, strength of it, you know? Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Let's go to something else. Oh, uh, obligatory question. Are the stipes hollow or uh, solid surface? So for Avalanche, the stipes are, I would say, three quarters of the way solid. And then they just have a little, just this little indentation in them that's right in the center okay. of it. And it goes down the center. Um, so they're mostly, they're mostly, yeah. Oh, this is a fun one. So this is a, a little bit of a bad picture, but if you can see it, this is Enigma, a coral mutation, which it grows uncontrollably over the span of seven weeks, just growing in size um, until it starts to go soft. Well, this was an attempted cross that I tried to make, Enigma and Trinity cross. Um, and uh, it failed because it produced pretty much all this coral mutation, but it also produce a coral mutation that simultaneously was growing a mushroom out of the coral mutation. Um, and did it do that just one time or do you get that on, on occasion? No, that's one that I'm going to have to test more, um, but I have okay. it cloned. I have it ready to test and stuff. It's just uh, with Enigma, it's hard to get the, the uh, attention or the will to test it because of how sure. long it, of a fruiting cycle it is. Yeah. Um, um, so somebody asked here, uh, do you use normal CVG for your substrate on all your mushrooms? Or what do you use? I, I totally recommend CVG, but I also um, tell people that adding straw to your CVG, if you're going to make your substrate yourself, adding straw to it is fantastic. You can use Timothy hay, you can use straw, you can use anything that's um, that fibrous. Um, sure. It will make your, your substrate more airy. It will make the um, moisture distribution in it a lot better. And um, I just really love the way it runs with straw in it. Manure is totally optional. And, um, you know, some people swear by it that it gives you bigger fruits. Some people swear by it that it gives you more flushes. Um, I've never really been convinced. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen better results and worse results. I've seen more flushes and faster contamination, you know. So it's sure. some sometimes... Um, it does work. Sometimes it doesn't work. And, and I don't really think I have a lot of conclusions I can make about that, you know? Cool. Now, uh, I had a buddy. Um, well, I still have him as a buddy. But uh, we used to talk a lot about alternative substrates. And he, sure. uh, he has a substrate called Forest Floor, which God knows what's in it. But I'm pretty sure I know where it comes from. <laughs> um, and he is a huge proponent of straw. And he always said, like, look, you know, cubes grow on manure and yeah. everybody thinks it's because of the manure and it might just be because there's a bunch of straw and hay and grass and mm -hmm. other like very fibrous grasses in the manure yeah so, so that kind of rings true hearing you say that and, and, and the fact that he's i've seen lots of his grows that way so i have to get me some hay yeah um Absolutely. Straw is a great one. And also, um, I do recommend to people think about your substrate a little different. Like, um, if you are just trying to get by, if you don't need anything extra, if you're not growing for better yields, or if you're not growing for any specific purpose, like CVG is fine. You could even replace all the cocoa coir with, you know, whatever sawdust, if you wanted to, um, the medium really, the only importance in it is that you don't compact it too tight. You, but you do make the surface nice and even. Um, those are really important. Uh, yeah. You have any other questions for me? Um, yeah, let me find out here. Uh, so how about we open up a little Q&A session here? Um, okay. Um, uh, I'm simultaneously addressing what, what I'm being told as a mic problem. When I do this, I don't hear myself because it causes, there's like a latency to it right. because I use StreamYard. So I never can hear myself until the end. Um, but, but fortunately, people are telling me uh, that there's an issue, which I'm trying to address. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if it's, yeah. uh, if I can address it. But yeah, so uh, anybody with some questions here? Um, 
I think I had one above. I'll go up while people are. Oh, uh, this one's kind of funny. Um, yeah. Hunter L. Is Enigma just That's mushroom a cancer? That's great question. And actually, I've described it as a tumor before to people. Okay. Um, now, it might not be 100% accurate to describe it as a tumor because maybe it doesn't entirely function like a tumor, but it reminds me quite like it. Um, it seems like Enigma is stuck in a premature phase of growth as an organism, that it's not able to uh, reach maturity because it's in this stage of growth that is rapidly concentrating uh, tryptamines and never stops concentrating tryptamines. Um, it also never seems to stop growing. Even when it's rotting, it seems to want to continue growing until it basically just dies. Um, it's not producing any spores or anything like that. So yeah, I, I like to describe it as like um, when, uh, when a mushroom catches a, you know, catches a disease and, and it has a transcription error. Like it just keeps making more copies of itself. Um, so yeah, Enigma is an interesting one. And I honestly, personally, in my opinion, um, and from my observations, I would say that it's not actually a strain. Enigma originally comes from tidal wave two. And so that may be technically a strain. Um, but the Enigma mutation itself is just a form of growth that a lot of cubensis can take under certain stressing, stressing conditions. So, so what do you mean by it's not a variety or it's not a strain? If it's repeatable, yeah. um, isn't it? Or, yeah, or yeah. It so just, what, what I'm it... saying is, uh, what I'm saying is in the Enigma mutation itself is um, not unique to Tidal Wave 2, okay, right? Okay. So it's to say that any cubensis can produce this mutation and it can I look almost identical and, or even identical to the tidal wave two enigma mutation. Right. right. Um, and so just to say that like, yeah, enigma is not in and of itself a strain. Um, but the enigma that comes from tidal wave two is a strain. If I were to see a coral mutation that looks just like enigma, but comes from Kosamoy or from golden teacher or from something like that, I'm okay. probably going to colloquially refer to that as enigma. You know what I mean? But it's not technically enigma. It's okay. Okay. So you're coral. saying that sometimes we see the similar coral mutation yeah. in other fruits. And in that case, that's not a strain, but the yeah, enigma that, that, that coral came mutation, from TW is definitely, they would all okay. be individual strains, right? So it's like gotcha. golden teacher. That would be a strain. Uh, the enigma that comes or the the coral mutation that comes from it. Do so you see what I mean? Like there's a little confusion sure. because it's like I want to call and a lot of people are to want to call because of the popularization of that name to call it enigma even when it comes from something else. Right. right? Um, so, yeah, that's just my little two cents on it is that um, it's it's something that any mushroom can do and it's mostly epigenetic. Yeah. Yeah. So I find that interesting that. um there's a lot of, I get a common question in the Discord is, hey, I have this mutated fruit. Should I clone it or or not? Right. And in my experience so far, I would say at least two thirds, if not 75% of the time, it, it's, it's, it's not epigenetic. It. It's yep. an environmental factor that caused right. some sort of growth mutation. I, like you said, with that Melmac, the crinkle on the top mm -hmm. of the stipe, I get that if I let my Melmax go mm -hmm. um, and if I do like a secondary water, basically they suck up all the water from the cake. So I add a little bit more water mm -hmm. and in that second go, then they get bigger and fatter and it seems to thicken that up. But, but not everything is going to repeat. But then just as soon as I think that, then I have Dave on last week and he's like, yeah, man, I just saw this cool mutated fruit and I cloned it. And guess what? It kept doing yes. the same damn thing. So, yeah. So, so I mean, my, know. My two cents on that is just that um, mutations have a lot of potential to produce interesting <clears throat> cloned varieties, uh, interesting uh, replicable results from, from cloning them, um, but it won't always, right? And it's impossible to tell whether it's epigenetic or not until you try and replicate it. So I would say like, do it, do it, do it, and even clone aborts, clone, clone anything that looks cool. I, I had a mushroom that had a lot of aborts that were pointy cap, like, like a long point on the top of the cap but mostly on the aborts so i clone those okay. and hopefully the next round i'll get mushrooms that don't abort right. so much but have those pointy caps right um 
and, and you don't know until try. you try. You just, just don't. Try. You literally just don't. Yeah. Know until you try. Yeah, and and I think maybe you know in the future we might have a better idea as to which mutations come from where because like we we are getting certain sequencing results back that are showing us like oh hey look sure. maybe one or two genes are responsible for like yeah. albino pigmentation or or for psilocybin production. Here's the yeah. gene cassette that does that. You know like um, it's it's um, I think in time that that will have more use for that. For, for making prescriptions on that. And stuff. Oh, hundred percent. Uh, Julian was, uh, posted some, I think it was only a couple years old, but, uh, an article where they were trying to capture the actual, uh, sector of information responsible for, uh, albinism in, I forget. My talkie. Boys. Oh yeah. It was my talkie. You're right. And uh, yeah, so they they did a couple, you, you know, they isolated, they did some back crossing, and abracadabra, they now know this is the the specific mm -hmm. gene for that, and then right. they were able to make it not a recessive trait, but a dominant trait, and stabilize right. that. So yeah, why not? Eventually, we're probably what five years or less away from all of us doing this shit in our house anyway. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, you know, whether it's me or anybody else, like we're all a lot of us are working towards um, making ways to do even more insanely uh, varied crosses with these mushrooms, like protoplast fusion or uh, not protoplast fusion. Sorry, yeah, protoplast fusion. Yeah, which would be like. Yeah. Um, preparing bare cells, removing the cell wall, putting it in a solution that enables the cell to stay intact, yeah. and then taking these two bare cells and pairing them together. Mm -hmm. We've we've had results in in certain um, research papers that I've seen or that I've read that that um, you know, or they're crossing Ganodermas with things that are not even Basidio mycota. They're they're out of the order of yeah. this mushroom, right? Um, and so I, I would imagine that this is a method that I'm really trying to move towards to start gourmet crosses because I think uh, crossing outside of the species would be considerably easier this way um, wow. and probably give you more more distinct and noticeable results, right? And then you can real I mean, then it becomes an art. An and art. You can go, we get I, green I'm gonna, and yes. blue and pink mushrooms. And, you know, it's like, oh, all we have all these oysters. Let's cross them together and see what yeah. happens. I want to blue i want a pink king oyster it's you know <laughs> all right um, i got a question for you from uh my buddy royce who's on my discord mm -hmm. and just one of the nicest guys i just want to give a little shout out to royce here um, but he says when doing a transfer is it okay to continue the transfer if the mycelium peels off the agar and your transfer contains no agar from the previous dish yeah mycelium is all you need the agar from the previous dish is just usually a uh let's call it like a um uh, backboard, right? Mm -hmm. To get to, to transport. It's just to keep the mycelium from slumping in on itself when you, when you transfer it. Um, so, it, it, you know, I've, I've, I've um, made liquid culture this way. I've, I've taken transfers this way. I've done all sorts of things where you can just scrape the top of the mycelium without even taking the agar yeah. and move that onto your new plate or into a jar of liquid culture or whatever floats your boat. Yeah. I, um, somebody gave me, I can't even remember who told me this, but uh, oh, I think it was a guy I met at Spread the Spores in Detroit oh, mm. when I got to actually hang out with, with your, your and my buddy, Tim. Um, the guy was talking about if you get a plate that just out of the blue, some small area just starts running like crazy, like rhizomorphic mm. growth. He said all he does is just grab the absolute tiniest bit of that tip. Just the, mm -hmm. I mean, hardly anything. He yep. says, you just put that tiny little speck there and he goes, not always, but sometimes that thing will just go bananas. Yeah. Yeah. I do recommend to people like take smaller transfers. I do take um, sometimes larger transfers when I'm running things in certain phases, but like if I'm really trying to get a culture to start performing and it's not running right, you, you want to take the smallest transfer possible because all you need is a couple cells, you know, to replicate. And, um, and so no matter what you size you take, it's going to be more than a couple cells, oh, you know, right. <laughs> plenty more. Um, so yeah, uh, like a little sliver and put that on the next plate, right where the perfect area of growth was. Take that sliver, put it on the next plate. Beautiful. Yeah. It'll most likely have no other forms of growth attached to it unless, and this is what you want to watch out for, unless that other form of growth is underneath 
um, I've seen it to where the mycelium wants to sort of grow under or over, um, and you might grab snag two types of growth on, on one transfer. Well, do you ever get the aerial growth? And, mm -hmm. and I love those because I almost wish I just had like a little uh, cutter, like a miniature pair yeah. of scissors to just snip off a tiny snip bit. But I love grabbing those and I just put one of those little flakes in and, and that, yeah, that usually works great. Too. Some tweezers might actually work. I have, oops, I always use these uh, stainless um, tweezers uh, for um, people like to put the whole swab tip, uh, cotton swab tip onto mm -hmm. the agar plate. So I'll just snap the tip of the swab off of this and stick it on the agar plate. I do that, but I use uh, a pair of needle nose pliers. That's probably that, a good idea. That I use to make sterilizers with. But uh, I just I just flame the crap out of it. And yeah, yeah. I do the same thing. I, I got so sick of... I watched uh, DC Mac do a, a, a one-handed technique, and I tried that a bunch of times, and I'm like, yep, I can't do that, so we're just no. going to go ahead and just break it off. Works great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I got a few more questions. Um, oh, where is it here? Oh, um, oh, I'll save that one for the end. But uh, So Thomas Thompson said, and we've talked about this in a previous episode, uh, does this mean that we'll have oysters that produce psilocybin? Um, I, I do think that's a good question. Um, the idea of oysters that produce psilocybin is interesting to me because I don't see um, a, a lot of a reason to do it. Oysters are really easy to grow, sure. Um, but I think cubensis are considerably easier to grow than oyster mushrooms. 100%. And um, the thing that actually makes cubensis mushrooms not uh, gourmet and not, not super amazing to eat is the fact that they have the psilocybin inside of them because tryptamines are extraordinarily bitter. Um, so no matter what you put the psilocybin in, you're going to make it bitter um, by putting it in there and make it less tasty. Wait, um, Lumbo, did you say bitter or did you say better? <laughs> and that depends on your perspective if you're a big hops guy hey maybe you yeah. like that yeah. um yeah ipa let's do yeah. it let's yeah all the trend and i highly recommend um do uh look for a book called C cooking with cubensis um mm -hmm. it is awesome I, I i love the idea of people actually taking these cubensis mushrooms and cooking with them so i mean in my mind, gourmet mushrooms more have more potential to be crossed with other gourmet mushrooms to get you unique morphologies, unique flavors, unique colors, things colors, like that. Sure, uh -huh. yeah. um, whereas like the psilocybin, I think um, we have these fruits and they're actually, I mean, it, if you were to take all the psilocybin out of these fruits, they're, they, they taste just like a button mushroom, maybe more like a right. beach mushroom or something. It's It's got a meatiness and maybe a little mm -hmm. bit of, maybe a little bit of seafoodiness, but probably not a lot. Um, and then, yeah. So, you know, use one of these books and just get into it, make, make real foods with these to dose with. I think it's an amazing thing. Yeah. So do more than just put a few of them on top of my burger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, cause I think, I mean, you don't have to obviously, but I do think it's fun. I think it yeah, um, adds to the experience a lot. I think if you're growing your own medicine, I think it's, really advisable to just pick them fresh, cook them up somehow, however you want to prepare them and, um, and eat them. Even if the heat is, is damaging some of the tryptamines inside of your uh, mushrooms, your meal will come out infused. It will come out with yeah. enough for you. And, um, and I think it's just an awesome way to actually ingest. Yeah. Uh, okay. I had another one up here. Oh, uh, here we go. We're going to cover some of the basics. That's um, a good question. So yeah, give me, you know, what grain do you use? Do you grow in tubs? Do you grow in bags? All, all the simple, basic, structural, practical aspects of your growing. Yeah. Um, well, tubs, um, I find that there are advantages and disadvantages to tubs and bags. Um, I use, for the grains that I use, I use whole oats. Yeah, let me start there. Sorry. For mm -hmm. the grains I use, I use whole oats as my main grain. I really like them. They're a large grain um, that has a very hard hole. So yeah. they're really hard to overcook. That's my main thing with them is that you won't get mushy grains with the whole oats. Um, the other thing I like to do is I actually mix. So I'll do like 75% whole oats, maybe 25% um, millet. The, it's a very hard, very small grain. And that 
tends to not cook uh, up all the way nearly as well when you use my methods because mm -hmm. I don't boil my grains before I bag them. I just put my grains in the water or my grains in the bag, my water in the bag. I fold it all up and then I pressure cook, right? Yeah. Mm. So I like to use that mix. I really like my a little bit of Milo. I might even put like 5% Milo in there instead of 5% of the of the millet. Oh, um, you're really you're going full, full tilt grain cocktail right now. Yeah, right? because okay. I've found that um the variance in there does help with the strength of my mycelium. When okay. I have just whole oats, it can be a little bit wispy. The mycelium isn't fully thick. When That's I break true. that block up, um and it's and it's Milo and whole oats together. I break that block up, and there's like chunks of just pure mycelium on the inside of it. It's so thick, you know. Interesting. Um, whereas when it's just one grain or the other, um, a lot of times I'll have a more wispy, less dense running um, block. Now that's just in my experience. So mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying is, all of these grains are useful, but this is how I use them, and this is just what gives me the best results. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, so I run the triple washed whole oats. That was mm -hmm. my first grain. Uh, my first good mentor uh, got me on oats. Plus, they were like tw literally twelve bucks for a fifty pound bag. Mm -hmm. and, and then I then I went millet gang hardcore. Yep, exactly. Yeah. It's it's hard. It's really hard to beat the the oats are pretty great, and they do the no soak no simmer really mm -hmm. well. With I put a little gypsum in my water, and they mm -hmm. never clump up once you get the the volume dialed in. Absolutely. But but I got started doing fifty fifty millet oats mm -hmm. off of uh, Earth Angel mushrooms. Was talking about it on a video, oh. and so it's interesting that you are doing more. Like not just running 50 50, but mm -hmm. you know, just doing a smaller amount of millet, you do get yeah. more inoculation points. But the great thing about the oats is they're juicier, they're, they're juicier. Just, they're just and juicier. I will say, um, as far as pricing goes, it's just better for me. Like, yeah. um, where I live, um, millet is really expensive, and whole oats are a lot less expensive, right. like uh, almost twice as, as cheap or twice, two times cheaper, right? So you know, if I'm paying $30 for a bag of whole oats, I'm paying $50 for a bag of millet. I'm just going to use less of that millet. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so I, uh, I'm going to have to get out of here in about four minutes. Um, so dude, that's, can... that's fine. I get it. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time here. Yeah. Um, I it, appreciate you it, having me. It, it, it's, it's been great. Now, if people are interested in trying this, you, are you still selling a kit or are, have you yet? For my recombinations? For the recombination. Yeah, I'm still selling a kit right now. It's, um, you know, not the most professional that it could possibly be. I'm still just like putting all the things together in an But if we box. wanted to try it, we if can we go to your, it, yeah. your, okay, cool. Absolutely. Right. And I'll get you what you need. Um, with the kits, please do intend to use them within a month. And if you don't, stick your kit in your fridge um, okay. or take the buffer solution out of your kit, put it in the freezer um, because that awesome. will expire. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully we can get you back on here again and hopefully I can get this uh, audio problem. I, I've been plagued with audio problems. I, maybe you I'm just trying to seem to have hard. fixed it in the last few minutes. Um, okay, so, good. Good, yeah. good, good, good. Cool, man. Well, uh, it was great having you on. You have a good yeah. night. And uh, for everybody who tuned in, thanks for tuning in. And uh, let's let's do some of this. Let's make yeah. America trade, trade spores. spores. Hell yeah. All right. All right, until next week, uh, we got Yoshi coming on next week, guys, so stay tuned.